In this podcast, I'm joined by Mike and JJ Ducart, and we're talking about the best time of the year, pre-rut, moving into the rut. This Halloween, early November time frame can be killer to catch big bucks on their feet during daylight hours. So we talk about pulling all the tools out of the toolbox, when to be aggressive, jump in, and chase big bucks on the best week of the year. The Deer Society Podcast is brought to you by Delusion Hunting Systems, Onyx Hunt, Reveal Cellular Cameras, 10-Point Crossbows, Crime Archery, G5 Broadheads, Osseo Gear, Raw Frozen Scents, and HHA. Well, here we are. It is the arguably the best week of the year to be in the stand hunting. We wait all year long for this week. And pre-rot is here. Those are starting to come into estrus and the woods are coming alive. So let's just talk about what you guys are looking forward to coming up this week. Thinking about this time of the year, it's like everything comes into play. So <clears throat> does are starting to come into estrus, scrapes are still active, calling's a big part of it, rattling. Really kicks scent. in. There's so many different strategies that all, you know, water holes that are starting to chase, they're getting hot, hitting water, food plots, like everything we have for tools is pretty much in play. And that's probably why it's our favorite time of the year. Bucks are out moving, they're daylighting. Um, when the cold weather moves in, cold fronts, when the moon's right, I mean, it can be just the best time of the year, to, especially targeting specific buck. Yeah. Not just general deer movement, which is better off maybe during the rut and more cruising and chasing. But right now, as we approach you know, this Halloween time period shifting in November, some of the best times to, to get your target buck down. Yeah, you know, we've been hunting, you know, the earlier part of the season um, strategically, conservatively, don't like to go out in the mornings if we know there's a big deer there, but it's really all about patterning. So you're trying to, you're trying to pattern that big deer early on. You're trying to hit those windows where the, you know, the, um, the weather's perfect for you or the wind is perfect for you and stuff like that. And even early season, you know, you don't necessarily play the cold fronts, you know, as much just because you do play them, don't get me wrong, but I mean, you can play water early season because they need to get the water, you know, and they tend to daylight early season. But now it's just like, you know, there's, don't hold off for nothing. You better be in the timber. If you can sit all day without burning out a spot, good for you. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, it, it, it's go time. And strategies and techniques, it's all in play. Yep. Everything's in play. And the next seven to 10 days could be when you can be the most aggressive of the year. You can move into bedding areas and not worry about it as much. As you don't want to blow them up. No, you got to play your scent. You have to have the, the right scent control. Be aggressive. I know you were aggressive last year. A little bit more aggressive, moved a couple stands, you know, made some moves and got your buck this this time period. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about some things that went into play there or just in general, what your strategies are. Yeah. I mean, this is kind of a week that, or, or time period that I try to prepare for and, and just be ready to kind of pounce. We talked about Spruik scrape week, um, you know, uh, last week or a couple weeks ago here and, um, you know, being ready to move in once the target buck moves in, you know, on those scrapes. Now it's about, I think, understanding um, what those rut areas are, um, what those pinch points are looking. I, I take a big macro view of things this time of year, um, looking at things big picture and saying, okay, if bucks are cruising, where are they cruising? If um, they're searching for does or pushing does, where are they doing that? And instead of looking like, okay, this field or this um, a tree line. Like I, I really use Onyx and I look big picture and say, okay, where are these ridges coming together? Where, where are these kind of funnels? I know Joe Miles talks a lot about rut funnels, but trying to understand and study that from a macro level, um, and then being ready to jump into those spots and then just spend some time in the tree. Um, you know, that deer that I shot last year, sticker 10, you know, that was a spot that I had picked out, you know, 
a week or two before that and went in there, hung that stand because it was one of those spots that I didn't have pictures of him there, but knowing where he was and just understanding, looking at that macro level, um, it was like, man, that deer had to be coming by there. And then, you know, Lance had some encounters with him right in that area um, in the days leading up to um, the day I killed him. And then obviously went in there and killed him and it, and it all worked. It was like, it was meant to be, um, you know, I could just envision that. So, you know, I think two things. One, looking at where those deer are going to chase and check these does, check four does and, and just really cruise. And it's exciting because a lot of that activity is happening during the day now. Um, looking at those spots, spending time in the tree. And then also if you have the ability to looking back on some historical data. Um, so looking at past year's trail camera photos, especially if you're hunting a specific buck, uh, big believer that, that these older, more mature bucks, they know where to go, um, you know, during the rut. They, they know where those first does come in. They know where they want to take them. Um, I shot a deer a few years ago in the 80-10, and he did that same exact thing, moved into the same spot to rut. Um, so looking back at some of that past data, understanding, trying to understand where those deer are going to be chasing and tending does, and I think you have a recipe for success. And you can look at that historical data for a buck that you're targeting and try to figure out what he's going to do in advance and kind of just be ready for it, even if he hasn't shown up yet or, or moved into that pattern. Or you can just say, you know, what was this tendency I've seen the last couple of years that mature bucks in general do? And then you can try to get ahead of that pattern too. And just, you know, they like to work this area. They like to funnel through this spot. Yeah, we talk a lot about rut funnels with Joe. Joe Miles, he's a big rut funnel hunter. Um, I think that'll be an upcoming podcast, Rut Funnels. That's that's a huge aspect coming up to this this next phase in November. We're kind of in in this spot where we're shifting off of that big scrape, you know, scrape activity um, into a little bit of cruising, chasing, tons of daylight activity right now when the weather's right. If it's super hot, kind of uh, calms that down a little bit. And but it's still really good action, you know, on the front couple hours of the day and couple hours of the day, trying to get close to bedding. Um, still hunting a little bit of the food sources. Those does are coming into those food plots, into that corn, beans, whatever it may be, trying to kind of catch them on that transition there. Um, so still some of those strategies from all of October move into this phase, but now you're trying to figure out if those first hot does come into play. Um, some bucks will begin to lock down, but there's just a ton of moving and ton of uh, midday hours, late morning hours, bucks cruising. Um, so stand time the next seven, 10 days. Yeah, you can you know, find good locations. Get, get and water plays a big factor on that if you got a warm, you know, if you got an Indian summer. I mean, I remember times where we were hunting pre rut when they were really going strong and it was like 80 degrees out, you know, which people down south say, oh, that's nothing, you know, but up here, that's a, that's a lot. Yeah. But I, I kind of look at it a couple ways. So if you have a managed property, like not all of the properties that we hunt are managed, okay? We hunt permission properties. We hunt different places where we don't have control. And we actually did that for 20, 30 years before we actually purchased our own property. So that strategy to me is, is more of a general deer behavior thing. But if you have a managed piece of property and this really, um, the deer act the same, but if you have a managed piece of property and you have mature bucks that you target, and you have a history of mature bucks on that piece of property, they tend to have that historical behavior that's pretty consistent. So like I'm hunting a five and a half year old buck this year, and he's the oldest age structure on the property. There's one other one that age structure too. There's a couple other that could rival him because they have bigger bodies, but I think they might be a year younger. But anyway, so I'm hunting this older deer. I have him patterned. It's been a cat and mouse game. Um, he took over an area where the other dominant buck on the property took over. And then he was the junior buck and he did different things on the property. He never did what he's doing now because there was the alpha buck on the property that didn't allow him to do that. But now he's taken that over. So you have that behavior, which is different. So when when this guy goes into route, my strategy is going to be more about, and I've been watching him. There's an old doe, smart as heck. She's already picked up on me once in a tree stand. Didn't know I was there, where I was, but she knew something was in the area. 
causing all kinds of ruckus, you know, blowing, stomping, whatever. Wouldn't leave because she couldn't make out what was going on. So I don't know if she was smelling, you know, a rubber, oil, whatever. She wasn't smelling me. If she just, if she just smelled the human, she'd have been gone. So she's, she's causing trouble. She's still with her fawns. One of them's a button buck. And she comes to this area every day. She gets her drink of water, grabs some crab apples, whatever it is they do. Consistent behavior. And then this other buck or this buck I'm chasing, I think he knows her. And he comes in shortly after she shows up. It's either after dark or or it's just right at that, that time. And so consistently that's been happening all year. And I believe your mature alpha bucks will go after those old smart does. I feel they come into estrus first. I feel that they're the first ones to get bred. They're the first ones that will lock the, the alpha buck down. And so I'm looking at it that way. I'm watching her. And I'm thinking to myself, I know he's going to want to go after her. So if she stays consistent there, you know, that's something I would hunt more strategically. Older doe, doe trap. I mean, that's it's just a thought process that I'm thinking on with this deer. Okay. Now, if I'm just looking for a deer to shoot and there's multiple four and a half year olds and multiple three and a half year olds, if I was looking for a deer like that to shoot, I would be hunting completely different. You know what I mean? So, you know, what do you, are you hunting, you know, uh, land you don't control? That's a completely different hunt. Again, are you hunting public land? That's a whole nother hunt again. So, I don't know. I'm throwing mud at the wall here and I'm, I'm throwing, you know, ideas and situations. Think about that. What have you run into in the past and what strategy did you use? You know, on this alpha buck, it's all going to be about his behavior early on. His behavior, where's the big mature does? We got Cotton Eye Jane, we got her, you know. He's going to gravitate towards them. He ain't going to chase them little young does around. Yeah, I think that's that's an interesting strategy. And, and you know, one that I think we don't think about a lot is, is focusing, you know, we focus on the broad spectrum of does, but not a specific doe or a specific age class of does. So it's a, it's a super interesting theory um, and uh, super cool to think about it that way. Um, you know, I think that this is the time of year kind of on the other end of the spectrum where like, if you're, you know, paying a lot of attention, which we do to our cameras, right? Like cameras give us a lot of Intel on what's going on out there. Um, and I think this time of year, you can almost throw that out the, out the window. Um, in a sense. Now, I think it's to your point, like if you have does, especially specific does or whatever, coming to a food plot area, something like that, like brassicas, you know, now that it's, it's, we've hit that freeze period, like primetime plots are filling up now because they're getting sweeter. We've got that, that frost now, um, you know, deer piling in there. So that's a great spot to be. Your cameras can tell you that great spot to be. Does are there. Bucks are going to be there. Right. On the other hand, you know, how many times do you hear stories where you get in these spots and guys, they sit there and they don't see a deer and then they don't see a deer. And then the third day they don't see a deer. And then the fourth day, guess what? Big buck is cruising through there and you know, they're in the right spot. They're in the tree. So, you know, I think to your point, it, it really depends on the situation that you're in, um, kind of where you're hunting. But I think, you know, tree time is so important this time of year and don't get discouraged if you're not seeing a lot of deer because it just takes that one buck to cruise by there, the right buck, the right time, and you're in the cards. I mean, that that's how this guy to my right kills all his deer. It, it's his persistence and his consistency in the way that he hunts. Once he knows that there, it's that time of the year, he knows I need to be there during this time. He gets a good feel for what tree stands he wants to be in. He has an idea somewhat of the behavior, but he goes with his instincts and he's in a tree, 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 and he kills. And he's not seeing deer all the time. And that can be hard. I, I'm, I'm a little bit of the opposite. I've been doing it for so many years. I'm, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to take the easy stand. I'm going to take the blind. I'm going to do that kind of thing just because that's where I'm at, you know, I mean, I don't, I, I don't need to be in the tree, be in the tree, be in the tree, be in the tree all the time. Doesn't mean I don't want to, but my experiences are different. So I'm going to places where I'm seeing deer, knock on wood. I sat in a, in a blind and it's been what, three years now. And every single time, and I'm knocking on wood, 
I've sat in this blind. I have seen a deer. There never been one time in years in my sits I have not seen a deer in that field when I hunted. Now, I'm studying the deer's behavior now because I'm seeing deer. So what we talked about the doe thing, okay? You can tell the older does. It's obvious. You can tell the way they act. You can tell the way they are in the group. And then you got the groups. They'll come on there. They'll come in there. Now they'll start feeding in these fields. They'll be a little bit more, um, um, uh, they'll be more tolerant of other does and other fawns. So they'll actually mix more now than they would earlier on. Um, you know, that whole protect my fawn thing is kind of going away and they know they're going into the next step where they're actually going to boot the fawns out of there. I can tell which doe and is going to be coming into estrus first in that group. You just watch her behavior. All of a sudden, you'll see she starts just getting ornery. You'll see her start pinning her ears back. She doesn't want to be around the other deer. She'll even whack fawns on the head. I mean, I've watched it. And within a day, the rut was on. And when a good doe goes into estrus, it doesn't matter how old that doe is, the bucks are on her. Just period. That's just the way it is. So from a behavioral perspective, sitting in a you know deal like that, um, that's just another perspective I wanted to throw out there. But you can tell if a doe is in heat or going into heat, especially if you understand the deer in your area and you have a consistent experience with those deer too. Should have been taking notes. <clears throat> Got too many things to say with you guys talking about all those topics there. Um, hit on a couple of them. The doe going in early. So a couple years back in Wisconsin, 2018, 19, I think 20, Right before I shot Beamer, there was always this one doe <clears throat> that hung out on one spot of the property, and it seemed like she'd go into estrus the like 23rd, 24th, 25th October every single year. I don't know she got shot then after that because I haven't seen that pattern, but for three years in a row, all the bucks would just congregate in that area. You'd just have flurries of bucks, and like all the big bucks would show up in daylight and be running around for, for that time stretch. I haven't seen that since, so maybe there was a doe that got shot. You know, maybe it was one that always came in early. Um, I wish you could target those and, and not shoot them and, and try to keep them around. That'd be kind of fun. But so, yeah, I, I have seen that <clears throat> consistently a pattern on that type of thing. <clears throat> and then thinking about when you were talking about food plots a little bit and how deer are still using those and going to those. A cool thing about this time of the year is when, or maybe you were talking about food plots, but when the does are still using the plots this last week in October and um, you know, congregating in those areas, a sweet thing is if you wait long enough and it gets dark and the target buck doesn't show up, you're locked in your stand. I feel like at some point you're going to hear this a little buck or a two-year-old or a big buck come in and he's going to clear the field for you. So if you're patient, you can actually use the deer to get out of the field in the evenings, or it could be a cornfield, it could be a big field, but it seems like those small bucks save your, save your hunt and save your spot so many times if you're patient, because eventually... They just come running in and they blow up the field and they chase all the does and fawns off. So definitely use that to your advantage this time of the year. Um, and then there's, I think there's one other thing I was, I was trying to take notes when you guys were talking. I was like, what are yeah, the three yeah, things I, owners I about to do? Three of them here now. I'm losing um, them, but. So yeah, just a fun time of the year. So many different ways to, to play it. I think also thinking about some of the properties we hunt that aren't managed. You're basically just trying to figure out ways deer are going to use the property um, during the rut, how they're going to cruise through. There's different fence lines, different little, you know, um, saddles or, or low spots and pinch points that, that the deer use. That's what I've been trying to figure out the last couple of weeks on a few spots. I even talking to the landowner, like, what do you typically see, you know, during the rut and how do they use that part? And just trying to kind of pull out some information because this year in Minnesota, the gun season shifted back a week. So we have a little bit more of this pre-rut phase that we actually get to bow hunt. Um, gun season, don't, November 9th is when it kicks off season A, which in most states that's early. In our state, that's that's a later season, later start date. So we get a little bit more bow yeah. hunting, a little bit more fun out there, a little bit more natural movement that we get to capitalize compared to a typical year when the guns start going, you know, deer drives and there's a lot of commotion sent in the woods completely changes the game. So we got an extra five, six days this year. And, and that's why I've been trying to think, how are these properties that we got permission on going to work during the rut where do we need to set up based on the past because it's not a managed thing with water yeah, food and this and that it's you know, you what do you got how does it work with the big 
macro approach. And you, you tend to see consistencies in how deer travel through um, different properties. There's there's somewhat of a consistency to it. Um, but when that rut goes, think about the deer behavior and this. I and and deer behavior is my thing. Um, and so I tie deer behavior to the different strategies that I use. One example is deer behavior. The does start coming into estrus. Your bucks are trying to find trails. If you're hunting timber, your bucks are trying to cut trails and see if they can pick something up on a trail. So they want to hit, they usually go along the ridge tops because some trails go up and down. You know what I mean? And they can get more, they can cross more trails going across that ridge tops or, or ridge sides, those cross trails to see if they can pick something up or maybe they'll pick something up on the trail that they're on too. So that's a, that's a tendency what they'll tend to do. Okay. And it's usually based off of the wind dominance and here in Minnesota, where we are, our dominant wind is always West. So it's, it's a dominant West. And then you're going to have a Southwest or you're going to have a Northwest. And that's 90% of all the wind. Okay. It could be straight West, but anyway, it's West. So here, East to West trails are always those cut trails on a ridge. East to West Ridge are always a good place to try and intercept buck traffic. Okay. So that's one behavioral thing right there. Another behavioral thing is as we're leading up to this pre rut and rut, we've noticed slowly that the bucks are starting to get a little more serious when it comes to uh, sparring. Okay, it started out where it's just a little tickle, tickle, tickle kind of a deal. And then all of a sudden you'd see the same box who know each other come in and one of them will actually start to bristle up. You know what I mean? And he bristles up instead of tickle, tickle, it's kind of like, bam. And, you know, it's like, oh, that was a little more aggressive. I mean, they're not trying to rock each other, but you can see it changing. Now, when we get into this week, you just all out brawl battle, which freaks you out. You know what I mean? But they they come running to it. Now that's rattling, okay? And we've done that. We've done that cold rattling, especially in the morning. I like the morning when it's right when it's kind of dark almost. And you hit that rack and just go nuts. And, you know, that frost underground. And it just seems to be a good, a good one to do. Midday, not as much. I don't know why. But anyway, so that's just one thing that I learned from behavior. Another thing is from a calling perspective, I had a, uh, a, a nice, I think it was a four and a half year old buck, uh, dominant buck. He was on a doe that was in estrus, okay? And she was getting dogged big time, but he was the bigger buck. So he's on this doe and he comes in and it's just, brah, brah, brah. you know, he's just worked up he's right on her butt you know he's probably already bred her once and she's like that's enough and anyway so she tries to hide in the thicket and of course he's right there and he actually caught her she's she laid down to to you know just get a break he came in there and he nudged her with his nose and just Bruh! did one of those and i was like holy cow i'd never seen that before so mike the communicator grabs his extinguisher deer call starts mimicking exactly what he was doing okay the bra, 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 you know, it just, he couldn't believe it. All of a sudden I looked up and there was three satellite bucks come running in. I had four bucks surrounding me and that's communication. And that was real communication. It had already happened and I just extended it and it brought in deer like crazy. Now they were subordinate bucks. So they were just standing there looking like, you know, but that's one example of what you can do. We had a set one time. It was it was it was pre rot. They weren't really quite breeding yet, and it was a warm day. And we're sitting in the tree. I knew there was a, a nice ten pointer there. He's about one hundred and thirty back in the day. That was a beautiful buck. We'll, we'll shoot that with our bow. And so we're sitting there, and of course I'm big into the calling. I'm like, all right, Jay. It was probably I don't know five o'clock, at least a good hour hour or so before it was going to get to that magic hour, and. So I'm sitting in the tree, all right, I'm going to do a, a doe that's kind of, you know, worked up a little bit. And then I do that little buck chasing her. And then I'm going to do that growly thing, that roll, you know what I mean? And we're sitting there and it's warm day, blah, blah, blah. I go through the scenario. Little, 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 
like he's walking, kind of like when they walk and stuff. And then all of a sudden, I kind of made him feel like a little frustrated, went out for a little bit, and all of a sudden, I went, JJ just, I could feel the tree shaking a little bit because that's kind of our signal. And I look up, and he's laughing his ass off. He's just almost crying laughing. And I'm like, well, what? <laughs> you know? And the next thing I know, this is the signal. He grabs my leg and squeezes. And that buck I was talking about come running in. And for some reason, I had pulled on him. I had the pin on him and everything. For I do not, to this day, don't know why I did not release, but I didn't. I pulled down. He was really mad at me. And I just, it just didn't feel right. I just felt like he, that buck could get another year, you know? Like he's probably, what, three and a half or yeah. at the time? But that's the first, you know, I would say adult buck that I think I passed up. Mm-hmm. And uh, But these are scenarios. These are communication, man. It, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Do what they're doing. Yeah, on that communication note, we just <clears throat> actually um, released or, or coming up an art of calling or an art of deer hunting in that series. Um, check that out. Cause we were talking about calling during the pre-rut, um, and, uh, and rattling. So there's some good information there. So if you're thinking about, uh, communicating calling in these weeks, which is obviously like you just heard Mike talk about, there's some great information on some tips, how to do that. Check out that art of calling on YouTube. Well, one real quick one on that is like, we talk about these bucks running East West ridges. So I'll put myself in that position. And if you see them deer, you'll, and you you will, you'll see them bucks cruising through and they go through quick. And we used to buck run at them a lot. You know, that was the thing. Oh, throw a buck run at them. That'll get him mad. He'll come over. They, they did not respond to that hardly at all. In fact, and most times you couldn't even stop them. But the doe bleat in that scenario, when it's rut and when they're running them, the doe bleat becomes extremely effective. I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, and while you were talking about your calling sequences, mine are a little bit more um, conservative. Conservative, but I did rat or a uh, couple calling sequences this first week in November that I can think back on was actually my first buck I shot was doe bleeds. You know, at the time I thought it was the biggest eight pointer in the world, it ended up not being as big. I think it was just a two year old buck, but um, he matter. was cruising you, head down, was, crossing yeah. trails like you yeah. said along the ridge and. Um, two bleats, two, two esters bleats, just short bleats, and he just came right in, shot him, and then went 50 yards and died. So it was a pretty big rush, but being able to call him in, and he's just cruising. That was that was a huge deal. So that was a good early first week in November calling sequence. And then um, <clears throat> a buck I shot in Wisconsin about eight years ago. Or no, it wasn't a buck I shot in Wisconsin. It was the buck I was hunting before I shot the buck that I shot in Wisconsin. Um, the five-year-old buck, called him Hollywood, always on all the cameras and whatnot. Um, I was hunting next to some swamp area. Evening came, got into the stand in a big heavy pinch point and just laid out a nice sequence. So a little bit of rattle, rattling, some buck grunts, some estrus bleats, and you know, 30 minutes left of light. He came out of the swamp, walked up the trail, getting ready, got the camera ready. He's going to hit the 30 yard scrape. Right at the last minute, he just did the old zigzag and <laughs> I don't know, man, he just missed my shooting lanes and didn't get a crack at him. And neighbor ended up shooting him that year. Buck, I was um, hunting really hard, but then ended up shooting up actually an older buck that year. So yeah. ended up being a great year, but he came in to that sequence. It was quiet. Um, it's blind calling, you know, just calling back into that swamp, hoping there's a buck, does deer in general, bedded back in there, see if I could pull him out. And I was in between bedding and the food. Um, first week in November again, and and it worked out pretty good. He just he missed the trail. He's he got his head down, and he just started doing that smelling walk, mm-hmm. zigzagging doe trails. Look, didn't didn't focus on the trail that he'd been using all year, um, which had the scrapes on it. So scrapes are starting to dry up, coming up here. You know they're not using them as much. That was an example where he knew there was deer in the area, but he wanted to smell them. So he wanted to get on the on a doe trail, figure out if there's a hot doe and kind of avoided the scrape that was sitting there perfectly set up for a 35 yard shot with the cameras all pointed at it and he dodged the situation. So Yeah, and, and you talked about the the calling mm-hmm. there and I'm you know, we talk about that in the in the videos that are coming up. I talk a lot about volume, how important volume is. And in that situation where JG is the conservative caller, he had a nice calm day and, you know, 
that the extinguisher has the right <laughs> volume. It's not too loud, and it, it's it's so natural. No matter what sound you put out of the call, it's going to be some kind of a deer thing you're doing. Um, so you don't have to worry about making a mistake. Um, but the time of the year when they're they got their head down and they're moving, you got these crispy leaves, or it tends to be wind during the fall. Sometimes you need a little more volume. And so the extinguisher 2 o our tooling wore out on the original extinguisher. So we redesigned it, the 2 o to give you that little extra volume for that scenario that we just talked about. You know, crunching leaves and stuff like that. It's a little bit louder, a little bit more wind. So you get that little extra volume, but that it still gets very subtle and quiet because on those early mornings when there's no wind or right before the sun sets when there's no wind, you want that natural volume that goes with the natural tone. You, you do not want to be too loud, but there are scenarios where you do need that extra volume. And that's the beauty of that call. It, it can do everything. Yeah. So many times, you know, I think during this time of year, if you can couple like doe bleats, you guys talked about doe bleats working so well, I've seen it work great. And then, you know, coupling those doe bleats with, you know, some buck runs behind it. Again, it's it's just about, and you guys preach it, painting that picture of what is going on. So think about that. So think, think about the situation. Don't just call out there and blind call and whatever. Think about the situation that you're trying to create and call that way. You know, and I, and I, I think that, man, it can really, really work. Doe bleeds, especially mixed with some buck grunts, can be a killer combination. That's so nice about the extinguishers. It's like, boom, you just slide it up and down and there you go. You're, you're doing it all right there. Not a lot of movement. And it's so simple um, to be effective calling. Like I mean, we literally named the company after that mm -hmm. thought process and strategy you just described. It's you want to create the illusion of what's actually happening out there. And you do, that's exactly what you do. So that's why we designed the products to sound exactly like what happens out there. That's why we did what we did. And it's so important. So if you're looking for strategies on how to call deer, listen to them and watch them. That's your strategy. You can't get any better strategy than that. So we talked about being aggressive and really spending a lot of time in the tree uh, during this time of year. What are things that you're looking for um, when you're deciding where to hunt or what are some things that, JJ, that you might be um, overlooking, I guess, this time of year um, when going to sit? You know, are, are you paying so much attention to the weather or the wind or, you know, what does that strategy look like? You know, we talk about being aggressive, but is there any like things that you're like, oh, I'm not going to do that? Well, so much of October, we're watching weather windows, <clears throat> trying to hunt when there's cool weather coming in and fronts. <clears throat> this first week in November, I mean, you just got to hunt. So, I mean, if it's hot, hunt. if it's cold, if it's snowing, raining, I mean, hunt. you just got to be out there. Windy, even really windy days, we've had some crazy hunts. Oh, dude, we, we hunted a blizzard one time <clears throat> that was so bad that I had to wipe the snow pack off the lens of the camera. This is when we were first getting going. And- I mean, it was the big, thick, white, wet snowflakes, and it was just all over us. We were turning white. It was one of the best hunts I think JJ's ever had. Yeah, and just, I mean, the deer moving. I mean, the cold fronts get them moving even more, but it's the time of the year where they're just cruising in general, trying to, because they're limited. I mean, they get one chance to breed, not one chance to breed, but one time period to breed, and they're going to take advantage of it, so... Um, yeah, had, had, when the weather lines up, it can be the best time of the year. Thinking at years past, you know, sometimes this time of the year, you're, you're set up with your October setups with food and water and waiting for them at night and you're hunting a lot of evenings. And then you get into November and you kind of feel like maybe you're out of the game a little bit and, and you're kind of a little bit too far from the action. The bucks are back in the thick areas and they're pushing does, starting to push does back in a little bit. And this might be in a couple weeks more so than, than this next week when they're cruising, but start to move in a little bit tighter on bedding and downwind of thick bedding and um, pinch points between two bedding spots coming up in these next two weeks. So um, don't sit too too far outside looking in. Um, be aggressive, like we've said. Uh, be aggressive, try to find those pinch points and um, don't be afraid to sit through I mean, mid, we, midday hours too. We used to walk right into the core, <laughs> right into the core where they were running, where they were traveling, where they were bedding. We'd go in there and we didn't know any better. And deer would be, you know, most of them would be out still because it was dark. But, you know, we'd be bumping deer every time we went in, but it had zero impact. 
Yeah, if your food source, because they're still feeding at night, if your food source is, at least the does are trying to feed, the bucks aren't feeding as much, but they're still hungry. If your food source is really far away from your thick bedding, you can get in there in the morning and sometimes they're not back there yet. Um, that kind of goes for the entire month strategy. So you can kind of slide in there and then you wait and they keep kind of funneling back through. Um, whereas earlier in the year when, that's why we don't hunt October mornings, they're already in the bed and they're not moving quite as much during daylight. So you can be a little bit more aggressive, try to jump in there before they get back in there. I don't know if that's kind of what happened with your buck last year. He, well, I don't know if he was going to bedding, but they're out in the big field. You kind of slid in behind them a little bit. You're still on the field edge. You're not like deep in the timber and then they filtered filtered through you. So I don't know if that was kind of the concept of that hunt. Yeah, in a sense, a little bit. I mean, I, I was still on a field edge. So it was, again, there was a big scrape there. And it was just one of those those areas that like, I knew that there was bedding kind of all around there. And it was just a transitional point. Like if he was up and he was cruising for does, like that was a point, a centralized location that he was going to come by. It was more a cruise spot than anything. Um, kind of right on the edge of a food source. So like had to had to go through some, some food to get there, but got in early, did it in the dark, very direct path to get in there um, without disturbing a lot of things. So it was, a, it was a direct route. Once I got in there, you know, I knew I was in a, was in a good spot. Yeah, actually somebody commented on the hunt breakdown. So it's called Sticker 10. I think it's at 60 or 70,000 views right now. It's doing pretty well. Um, released it a couple weeks ago. Hunt for Sticker 10, that's Brian's buck. Somebody asked, actually asked, well, how did he get in there in the morning? It yeah. was a big open cut cornfield. Yeah. I was like, well, we probably should have discussed that a little Dog bit more. Maybe, so yeah. Yeah. if yeah. you can hit on that. Yeah, it was really one of those things where you know, I could go in a lot of the way along a fence line, not disturb a lot of that open stuff. I could slip in behind some barriers, then had a fence line where I could get uh, basically directly across from that stand. Um, and then there's a little, uh, depression in that field, um, that I used to go straight across to that stand. Um, and, uh, it was like the most minimal impact that I could, I could getting to where I needed to be. Now, you know, did I have to cross a little open stuff? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's, I did not, not that I know of, no, but it was what kind of windy? Yeah, there's a little bit of wind there. It was cold, got in early, it was dark. Um, so, yeah, you're in there. It, when you're doing that scenario, you're getting in early. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's one of those risk reward type deals. But again, you know, we talked about it. it's that time of year where like risk reward, like you got to almost take the risk and get in there and it paid off. You know, sure, he could have been standing out in that open field and you bump him off, you know. Does he still come back through their cruise? And it's it just, there's so many variables there. But I think if you're going to take the risk, you know, a, a week before that, I probably wouldn't have done that. You know, I probably wouldn't have walked across that open field. But, you know, it was just that time to to jump in there and be aggressive and ended up paying off. Yeah, it's kind of like I said at the beginning of the podcast, all the tools are in the toolbox and ready for, you know, deploying this time of the year. It could be calling, could be rallying, could something we didn't even mention. Decoying could probably be pretty yeah, could, um, effective could, this yeah. time before they get locked on does. Scents, scrapes, food, water, they all come into play. Nothing's really out of play. Late season, pretty much one dimensional. It's food to bed kind of a thing right now. Everything's kind of fair game. You don't know what's going to work. There's So just start trying things, be aggressive. Um, Always watch your your scent. You know, definitely don't want them to smell you and figure you out that way. But you can get some bucks that are in kind of zombie mode, and if you can break them free and mm -hmm. paint a picture, you can definitely pull them in. So behavior in a food plot changes. Um, so normally they'll come in and they'll browse a little bit, blah blah blah. You know, you'll see bucks in velvet that are hitting up early beans, and they're in there for a while, and they're you know they're actually eating and feeding. And once this next week goes, they won't be. They may stop and take a bite or two but they're 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 cooking through that field they're not going to hang out in there mm -hmm. you know it's just that's the way it is with the bucks you know that's going to change um i had something else in my head too and i don't know if i can remember it i got a question um you mentioned decoys so this time of year if you're going to use a decoy you're using a buck decoy or doe decoy i think we pretty much only have been using buck decoy lately just because where we hunt there's so many dang so many doles and they just and even the buck decoy yeah they don't yeah. like that either so decoys have been tough have been tough lately but i could see it happening behave different if there's a buck decoy out there the dolls are like they don't really care to go buy it they'll look at it but they're not going to go running up to it and sniffing it where if there's a doe decoy there they just don't that's not a good thing 
Yeah. But in our in our scenario. Then the field clears and then if you do have just the one on one you're basically you're hoping with for the one on one encounter with the buck and what does he want a buck or a doe? I think he's gonna I don't know, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. Fifty fifty, what do you think? I think he'd respond to a buck better, but maybe maybe he'll check out the doe too. I don't really know. Yeah, I think it's 50-50. I think you could argue that, you know, they see a doe, that's what they're searching for, so they're going to come check it out. But I think uh, another buck, regardless, is going to invoke more of a reaction from from the deer. It's just me, but I, I've used both, and I've never had a deer come into a doe decoy, but I've had plenty come into a buck decoy. Okay. That's just my experience. So by default, I'm just going to go that direction. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think let us know what happens. Oh, I don't know. Decoy? You might have to test that out. We'll see. Lots of tools. Greatest time of year right now to be in the woods, be hunting. Big bucks are on their feet, daylighting. Get in the woods. Um, if you're listening to this podcast in the woods, make sure you have earbuds in and you're paying attention to what uh what you're seeing out in front of you. But um definitely check out all the good stuff that's there in the art of deer hunting, the art of calling. Uh, tons of tips there. So thank you for tuning in. Enjoy your time out in the woods. If you're getting some cool videos or harvest pictures, would love to see them. Make sure you send them in uh, to us on social media, Deer Society. Comment on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe. And Give us, uh, give us some feedback on that new extinguisher 202 because we, we want to hear what uh, the opinions are on that compared to the other one. Yeah, try it out. It is, it is like Ron Burgundy crisp over there, Mike. It is the extinguisher too. Uh, I think is going to kill some beer this year. So um, exciting stuff. Thanks for tuning in and good luck out there in the woods. The Deer Society podcast is brought to you by Illusion Hunting Systems, Onyx Hunt, Reveal Cellular Cameras, 10 Point Crossbows, Prime Archery, G5 Broadheads, Osseo Gear, raw frozen scents, and HHA.